if you're planning a trip to China, there are definitely some things that you need to know before you go, not only to make the most of your trip, but there are a couple of things that you do need to organize prior to your trip as well. So we're gonna run through all of the things that we found helpful or all the things that we actually had to organize before we went to China, uh, so you can do it too. So we begin this video with Chinese visas and how we got our Chinese visa. Yeah, so we were actually in Australia. Um, as Australian citizens, we need to get a visa to China, as I think is most common for most countries in the world. There are some exceptions, so be sure to check. Um, but this time around when we got our Chinese visa, we had to go to a Chinese visa service center. So it wasn't actually at the embassy or the consulate how it has been in the past. Um, and I do believe there are these service centers in many countries around the world. Yeah. So just check if you need to go to the consulate or if you need to go to the service center, yeah. um, which actually was pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, it was really easy actually. Yeah. And um, everything seemed to fall into the time frames that we were given in advance. So as a whole, it was a pretty easy process and we'd be more than happy to do it again. Yeah, so basically they recommend that you do this at least a month before your trip, no earlier than three months before your trip. And for us, it took about four business days, I believe, by the time we put it in yeah. to the time that we actually got it back. You do need to provide a lot of documentation, like where you're staying, how you're getting there, how you're getting out, yeah. uh, as well as other documents as well. Yeah, and not just what you intend to do, it actually has to be the photocopies of yeah. your flights and of your booked accommodation. If you are concerned that you're not gonna get your visa approved, there is a couple ways around this. You can make sure that you book accommodation that can have free cancellation. You can try and do the same thing with flights, although that can be a little bit trickier, but yeah, you do need to provide those things. We are gonna have a whole video and article just on Chinese visas, what you can do to get one, different options as well. We've also done this process another way, so we'll go into that as well. And yeah, we've got a whole video and article coming for that. Yeah, so we'll link them below as soon as they're available. So another consideration for a trip to China are VPNs and internet. So in China, a lot of very popular um, websites like Google, Facebook, um, YouTube, YouTube, even Gmail. Yeah, you're gonna have trouble accessing them in China because they're not gonna be allowed, they're gonna be blocked. So workarounds for this are to get a VPN. And we won't go into too much detail about them. We'll have a whole video yeah. and article again on VPNs in China and what our favorites are, because we tried a few. <laughs> but definitely uh, they are something that you should look into getting, not even for a trip to China, but just in general, they're yeah. a good tool to help protect your privacy and your computer and stuff like that yeah. as well. Yeah, so whenever you're logging on to like a public Wi-Fi, it's really great to have a VPN. Um, just for extra security and protection. Yeah. You do need to get one before you get to China. So get a subscription and download it to all your devices before yeah. you get there. Yeah. And our absolute favorite one was ExpressVPN. Yeah. So we'll have that linked below as well. And like Chris said, we'll go into a whole nother video on why it's our favorite, the challenges you might still have, and how it compared to the other ones that we tried. So when it comes to internet as well, there are a few different options, but First and foremost, make sure that your phone is unlocked and able to accept a Chinese SIM card before you even arrive in China. Um, and for us, we loved using China Unicom and had no issues with it. It was easy enough to yeah. organize in a China Unicom store and yeah, had no problems and we would recommend it. Yeah, so I'd probably make sure, I mean, having internet on your phone is so handy in China. Yeah. Um, so I'd probably make sure that maybe you had a couple of days of international roaming on your phone and when you get there, you can go into a store like Chris said and set up China Unicom. Yeah. Um, really affordable and super easy to just do with a passport in the store. Yeah. So when you're thinking about booking your accommodation in China, there are many ways to do this, but it's super easy. You can do it before your trip. We just book accommodation how we usually book accommodation our absolute favorite way to book accommodation is on booking.com. They have such a good range of hotels and prices. Um, really love all the reviews and how easy it is to use that site. So we always use that. Yeah. We also use Airbnb. 
Um, but we did have quite a few uh, challenges with Airbnb in China. As with most countries in the world, your accommodation and where you're staying will need to register you as a guest. And this is no different in China. And if anything, it's more important in China than a lot of other countries. So this is probably a big hurdle that we came across mm. with using Airbnb in China. So, so when you check into a hotel, they do this for you. They take your passport and they register your details. Um, that's all great when you stay in a hotel, but when you stay in Airbnb, you need to arrange this yourself or arrange it with your host. This involves going to the police station and actually filling out some forms and it really does require you to be there with your host. Yeah. Um, so the only thing I would say, we'll go into everything that happened with us in another video um, on our Airbnb experience in China. Yeah. But we would only recommend using Airbnb in China if you have confirmation from your host before you book that they will take you um, to help register your stay in China. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely something to look out for. So the currency in China is the Yuan, otherwise known as the renminbi. Um, and it's also, you might hear it around being referred to as a kuai. So when you're paying for things in China, the most common way by far in our experience to pay for things was with QR codes and apps like WePay, Alipay, even Apple Pay was starting to be more commonly used there as well. So the biggest difficulty we had with this was as tourists, we found that all of the apps needed to be synced up to either local bank accounts or local uh, yeah. credit cards as well. So this was definitely something that was possible as a foreigner that could set up a bank account, but as a tourist who wasn't gonna be doing that process, then we weren't able to get it working. Yeah, so we did try, we actually got a WeChat account, which is where WePay is part of that. But even to get a local WeChat account, we actually had to get approved by our Airbnb host. We had to have someone local to actually accept us. So it was trickier than it sounds. And then when we finally got WeChat to sync up WePay, we needed local cards. So that was our experience. Yeah. I believe this kind of thing probably changes all the time, but when we were there, it just wasn't possible. We couldn't get them to work. So because we couldn't use these apps, then your experience might be different, so it's definitely worth trying. But while we were there, we ended up reverting to mostly cash. Um, this was accepted everywhere as well. We had no trouble in Shanghai getting out money from ATMs, yeah. but we did always stick to one that we loved, which was ICBC, because we never had a problem with them, and that's a really common ATM yeah. in China. And outside of Shanghai and on our previous trip to China, we have had problems in the past getting money out from ATMs that don't accept international cards. Yeah. So if you can't, if you can't get one to work, you might need to keep trying around and get one that does. Yeah, and if you're in a sort of, the time we had this trouble, we were going from one train station in Nanning to the other train station and we needed to get a taxi and we had no cash, they wouldn't accept credit cards, and we had to try maybe like 10 ATMs, walking around to the next before one would yeah. work. Um, so keep that in mind and maybe if you know you're gonna be in that situation, make sure you have cash with you. Um, before your next leg of the journey or something like that. So we did actually find that we could use our credit cards. Visa and MasterCard were accepted in quite a few places at major shopping centers, um, major supermarkets, yeah. at fancier restaurants. We didn't have any trouble using those cards. Yeah. Um, and occasionally we were able to use our American Express card as well. Yeah, not, but, not many times, yeah. but generally speaking, just stick with Visa, MasterCard. Um, and if it accepts card, they'll be the ones that they'll be accepting. I wouldn't solely rely on credit cards in China. Yeah. You really do need to have cash available. Yeah. Um, and we found that process to be pretty easy. So of course, the things you book in advance, you can definitely put, pay with however you like. Yeah. But I would definitely recommend that however much cash or spending money you think you're gonna use while you're there, that you have that available in cash on your debit card because that will be yeah. the majority of the way you will pay for things. There are a few workarounds as well. If there's something that you're gonna be doing that you can also book and purchase online, you may be able to get around a few things that are normally cash only that you can normally get around that by paying for them online. From money that leads us on to a question, is China expensive? And in our experience, it's a bit up and down. So. Mm -hmm street food, a lot of other local food and stuff like that is actually really affordable and quite cheap. Mm. But then on the other hand, you've got other restaurants, more Western style cafes, um, coffee out at cafes, lots of other food items are also 
quite expensive. Yeah. So I think it is that big mix. So the regional areas will definitely be much cheaper than the cities. But even in the big cities, if you are there having local food and small restaurants and that sort of thing, it's still really affordable, I find, to travel yeah. in China. So where things do get a little bit more expensive in terms of food is obviously the fancier restaurants in the big cities and also the Western style cafes. I think in Shanghai, it was pretty common to have $8 cups of coffee in those nice Western cafes. But at the same time, you could also go get the best dumplings you've ever had for a couple of dollars. Yeah, so breakfast foods for a dollar each or something yeah, like that. So there was that definite divide between local and Western dishes. Overall though, most of the things that you will be doing um, will probably be more local. So overall, I think it's a really affordable destination. Yeah. Even things like the high speed train tickets, I for what you get for it, I think that's super affordable. Yeah. And definitely like local metros, we would be hopping on the metro in Shanghai and it was like less than a dollar each, one Australian dollar yeah. per person like for a trip. three to five yuan for a lot of journeys, which is pretty good. So when it comes to language in China, the most commonly spoken language is Mandarin. So it's a great thing to try and learn a couple of different, um, you know, thank you, hello, uh, numbers I thought were quite handy as well to yeah. when ordering things. Um, so even if you can learn a little bit before you go, that's great and it will go a long way. Yeah. Otherwise, when you're there, definitely make sure you download Pleco, which is sort of like an offline um, Chinese dictionary. It's super helpful. We use that quite a few times. I feel there. out of all the language apps that we had, that was one that we probably used the most. Yeah, it was really um, accurate and yeah. yeah, just really handy to have. And another one that we loved is Google Translate. You do need a VPN to use this one, yeah. but you know you can read menus and hover over yeah. the menus and read it in English. So it's really, really great um, yeah. anywhere in the world to use Google Translate. So definitely make sure that you download those before you go and that'll make your time in China just so much easier. Yeah. So you might be wondering how common it is for people to speak English. Um, I would say that in the major cities you'll definitely come across lots of people who do, but you will also come across a lot who don't. If you're going to street food stores, if you're going yeah. to little local restaurants, you definitely will not be able to count on that. Yeah. So that's where it's great to have those apps and to know a few words before you go. And it's part of the fun as well, it's part of the whole experience. And in the regional areas you will definitely find that um, there are a lot less people who do know how to speak English, so just go prepared. Another thing to note as well when it comes to China and for us on our last trip Shanghai was air pollution and it was something that we were mindful of before our trip and generally speaking it wasn't something that actually bothered us or even really noticed when we were there. There was probably only a couple of days in the whole two month period that we thought we could feel yeah. it um, and generally speaking it's not something I'd really be worried about if you're just going to be going on on a holiday or on, yeah. on a trip. I have heard that it is much worse in Beijing. So you might definitely want to travel with a mask of some sort. We usually like the N95 masks. Yeah. Um, so if you do want to take a mask with you, then you can definitely um, use them as well. You will not be alone. There are a lot of people in China wearing masks. Yeah. Um, but there's also a great way to check on it because it does vary with the time of year, with the weather. So we downloaded a few pollution apps um, Air Visual, Air Matters and Plume and they were all great. So if you know it's a really high level of pollution in a certain period of the day, you can try not to do any like high energy activities at that time yeah. and just kind of monitor it. But otherwise we didn't find it was too much of a problem. Yeah. So when it comes to the water and drinking water in China, you can't just drink from the tap. You will need to get bottled water or make sure that it's a proper filtration system. But generally speaking, for a holiday, you'll really only be dealing with bottled water. Yeah, and they're readily available everywhere, so you don't need to worry about it. And brands that we liked were Nestle and Sabon. And you would see us every few days lugging yeah. our litres and litres of water back to our apartment. But they were always available and yeah. you have no problem. 
So there are a few things to know about the cultural differences in China compared to where we were from or where you might be from. So the reason I don't want to be negative at all in this video because China is such a beautiful place to experience, but I do think that if you know some of these things in advance, then you can just accept them and get on with your trip when you're there. Yeah. So some of these are positive and some of these are probably not so positive um, if you're not aware of them before you go. So we'll start with the main thing that you'll probably notice that probably you will find a little bit shocking and that is that it is quite common for spitting or clearing of noses on the streets. Yeah, so, we, we, had, we had quite a few run-ins with both these. Yeah, so you need to just keep your wits about you and be agile on the streets and maybe don't get too close. Um, but yeah, I think what you need to know about this is that from what we've read, it's to them, it's a cleansing thing. It's better to get things out than keep them in their body. So to them, they're not looking at it as something that is... Um, unhygienic they're looking at it as almost the opposite i did actually read they look at if we blow our nose into a tissue and then put that tissue into our pocket they think that's disgusting which i kind of get mm. now yeah. that i see that um but it's all about different perspectives and but that is one thing that you will probably find shocking if you're not used to it um and just be prepared and if you know the reasons behind it and yeah. you see it happening i mean just accept it and walk on it's just a part of the culture there and there's so much more that you can experience rather than getting stuck on these little things. So another thing that you might see is lots of people wearing masks. So this is for a few different reasons. I think air pollution is definitely one of them. Um, people who might already be sick and they're trying to actually stop spreading their germs to other people is really common as well from what we've heard. And then of course it might just be um, to prevent getting sick themselves. Yeah, but all these things are good reasons to be wearing masks, yeah. so don't take that as a negative, and if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. I think it's actually a really positive thing, um, because it makes us feel comfortable if we want to put on a mask for air pollution, or it made me feel comfortable knowing that people who might already be sick are actually covering up so they don't spread their germs. That actually yeah. made me feel a lot safer being on public transport and that sort of thing in yeah. terms of germs and getting sick. Another thing to consider as well is personal space or lack thereof. <laughs> Um, especially when it comes to popular areas or public transport lines, or lines. Lining up for tickets or there, things like that. There's quite often situations where personal space just doesn't exist. Mm. And um, yeah, you just need to embrace that, I think. Yeah. And uh, I think that it's all part of the experience. Yeah, it's just part of their culture. Um, lines and personal space, it's not really a thing there. So what you see as being quite rude might is not what they're thinking. They're not trying to be no. rude. It's just a different culture. So just be prepared for that because that is something I, th I think on our first trip in particular that really shocked me. Yeah. Um, but now knowing you know, what's behind it, just knowing that puts you in a different mindset when you go. So just be yeah. prepared for it and then move on. <laughs> Another thing that will happen quite a lot, especially in, outside of the bigger cities, uh, is people might take photos of you. They might take photos of you from a distance or they might come up and ask to get a photo with you. Yeah. So I think it's just the novelty of a foreigner being there. Um, so I think that's the main reason why it yeah. does happen. There, there's a lot of photos of us floating around, especially <laughs> of you. I think with me in particular, I'm very short. So it's probably the combination of a novelty of a foreigner and also seeing someone that is uh, quite short compared to most foreigners that might come their way. Yeah. So, but, but this isn't a China only phenomenon yeah. this has happened in quite a lot of it's quite common in over Asia yeah. as well um, so I think you just got to embrace it like I used to be really self-conscious yeah. and be like why do they want my photo or what's going on here but I think if you just embrace it they're just being friendly and they just want a memory of it I guess well, and I'm, I mean exactly that at the end of the day it just means that you meet a couple more people yeah. out on a day exploring a new place yeah and someone has some nice photos of you <laughs> somewhere and I just wanted to wrap this little section up with some positive things because these are some of the things that might shock you or that you might not be used to, but also some of the things that you might not be used to or the cultural differences are beautiful things. Yeah. So uh, on our last trip in particular in Shanghai, there were so many people out and about just singing. So you'd yeah. walk around the corner and there'd be like an older man like bursting into like opera sounding yeah. music with this beautiful voice. 
amazing it wouldn't happen yeah. in australia or some of the places that we've been and it was actually well in our experience anyway it was extremely common we'd go for yeah. a walk and it'd almost be it'd be every day basically yeah. we'd, we'd come across getting it. groceries going for a walk going to the park we'd always see people yeah. singing it was really beautiful and another thing that we loved was seeing in the mornings the practice of tai chi in the parks it was just so so calm and yeah. tranquil and it was a really good showing of community as well there yeah. was smaller groups bigger groups lots of different age groups lots of different areas that they do it in it was just really nice yeah so i think you got to remember like there's so many amazing different things in every culture um and they were some of our favorites so china actually has a really great public transport system so the high speed trains are amazing so that's a really easy way to get between all the major cities in China. It's also yeah. super affordable, um, I think, for what you're getting. And they also have a huge amount of internal flights and many, many bus connections as well. So getting around China is actually super easy. So another thing to know though about train travel in China is that you do need to leave a lot of time when you are traveling between cities. There's a yeah. lot of security go through, there's a lot of lines, they can be long. So it's not just like turning up to the train station with your ticket and getting on. We generally try and treat those train stations almost more like airports because there's a lot of security, there's a lot of processes to get through. If you've got to collect tickets, which yeah. for us, we would try and buy them online and collect them from yeah. the train stations. There's a lot of processes and a lot of time that you need to add in to actually getting on the train. Yeah, so make sure you leave plenty of time. And in terms of buying tickets, so we did prefer to buy the tickets online beforehand and then yeah. you do still need to go and collect them at a ticket office there. But yeah. it's usually in the shorter lines or at a different counter. So that was a lot quicker than yeah. actually lining up and buying the tickets yeah. at the train station. You can buy them from the train station as well and they do tend to be a little bit cheaper if you do that. Yeah, so moral of the story mm. is some of the train stations in China are huge mm. and some of the processes take quite a long time. So I wouldn't be booking any really quick connections, mm. especially if you need to collect tickets in between. So once you arrive at your destination in China, especially in the smaller or bigger cities, there's plenty of ways to get around. You can walk around by foot. Usually they have a really good metro system. Um, which is generally pretty affordable. Yeah. Uh, they also have taxis, but just make sure that you have your address or where you want to go written down so that you can show them. And also things like Didi, which is kind of like our Uber, but is really popular in China. So we actually tried to download this app um, during our stay, but we couldn't link it up to cards. So we were completely unsuccessful with that. Yeah. So we usually just use the Metro walking and uh, taxis when we needed them. So, so for the metro routes in the major cities in China, Metro Man is a great app that we loved using in Shanghai. So also the Shanghai Metro app, if you're in Shanghai, was also useful for us. So in terms of what map apps to have on your phone if you're walking around or trying to find something, um, a lot of people or a lot of sites said that Google Maps would not work very well in China. And one of the main recommended map apps is Baidu Maps. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but we actually found that one was quite hard to use and we ended up actually relying on Google Maps pretty heavily. Yeah. But in saying that, Google Maps certainly had its challenges yeah. and I don't know if a power to be was playing games on us, but we tended to find with Google Maps it would be accurate, 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 mm. then all of a sudden it had put us blocks away. Yeah. So we ended up getting lost a couple of times using Google Maps, but in saying that, we'd still recommend it because when it was working, it was working yeah. really well. And we were there for two months and things like that only really happened... A handful of yeah, times. Yeah, not so. even. So we still think Google Maps was great, but other yeah. map um, apps that you can try, uh, Apple Maps is meant to work great there. Great? <laughs> it can work great. <laughs> and Maps.me is usually pretty good too. So we'll run through a few things to know about food in China and we'll begin by the fact that majority of the time you'll be relying on your chopstick skills. So we actually love using chopsticks and use them as much as we can and uh, whilst we're not amazing we're certainly <laughs> able to eat. <laughs> and some things are way more challenging to eat like dumplings and things 
but like the really firm, big dumplings with yeah. your chopsticks. So you I, will find challenges even if, if you are used to chopsticks. If, if you have a trip to Shanghai, I can assure you, if you look around, if you go to a place that everyone's eating Shenzhen Bao, it'll be quite an uh, entertaining experience <laughs> watching everyone eat, even the locals. And I will say, I did revert to stabbing my dumplings <laughs> from time to time. But otherwise, it's just a great way to practice your chopstick skills, so just look at it like that. Um, if it takes you a bit longer to eat, it's just a way to practice slower eating. But yeah, most restaurants will just have chopsticks and spoons for soups and things like that. And then you will get knives and forks at more Western restaurants and at maybe fancier restaurants and things but like I that. But I can't say we came across knives and forks. Too Outside often. of cafes, I can't yeah. really recall anywhere. So when it comes to menus, if you're talking all the local street food places or local uh, other local restaurants yeah. and little hole in the wall type places, majority of the time there won't be much of anything in English. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, it was also common in some places to have more of like a photo guide for some dishes. Mm. Um, but it was also common for there to be nothing. So generally speaking, we'd always have a handful of dishes that we'd want to try in general, as well as a few dishes we'd want to try from specific places that we're going to. And we just have them written out already just to show so we could just easily order. Because sometimes in these restaurants and local places, it was quite hectic at times and quite busy at times and you really needed to know what you wanted to order. But another great way around that is just looking at what everyone else is eating and literally yeah. just asking for what they're having. Yeah, we so, did that quite a lot. Yeah, so that's a good way to do it. Or even just knowing like what the name of um, certain meats are, if you want to look for those in the menu. And this is where your Google Translate app will come in really handy because you can use it to translate um, all the menus there so yeah. it's a really quick and easy way to still put in your order of what you want yeah and i mean with, when it comes to some of the menus and the characters both handwritten and printed the translation sometimes wasn't a straight translation <laughs> so you do need to kind of read between the lines sometimes <laughs> um but yeah as a as a whole just have fun with it have, yeah. you get to try a few different things that you might not have tried already but just keep an eye out for things that you don't want to eat rather than things yeah. that you want to eat <laughs> So another thing to note during your trip to China is that food actually differs really greatly from region to region. So that's great because as you move around China, you'll get to taste lots of different types of cuisine. Yeah. Um, where it's not so great is if you're in an area and you really love a dish, once you change areas, it will be harder to find that dish because the cuisine does tend to change in different regions. Yeah. Um, but Obviously, in the major cities, in the bigger cities, you'll have more chance of having a lot of those different regional specialties yeah. from over China in the major cities as well. But as a whole, the cuisine from all the regions is quite different from one another. When we were in Shanghai in particular, we really loved an app called Bon App. And this was like a review site for different restaurants and cafes. And yeah. we found some great places to eat through that app. So yeah. if you're going to Shanghai, definitely download that before you go. And for all other food recommendations that we have, we're going to be linking all our different videos and articles below. We're going to have a lot of them, so definitely keep an eye out for those. <laughs> so in terms of eating street food and getting um, ill or not getting ill, um, we haven't had any problems in China no. on our two trips. Yeah. So we've found that as long as you go to somewhere that other locals are eating at, or even sometimes we haven't in the bigger cities and never really had a problem. Yeah. Um, I think you need to be a little bit more careful or diligent in the more regional areas. But yeah, if something is popular, then yeah, we haven't really found that yeah. we've had any trouble with that. I don't know. So I think the same rule applies just to street food in general. One thing that we always do to try and minimise our risk of getting sick is always have a hand sanitizer with us and use it before we eat anything. So whether that's a restaurant, whether that's street food, whether that's anything, we always just wash our hands first. So I guess that's something that everyone can do just to minimise their chance of getting sick. Yeah. Another thing we do tend to do when we know we're going to be eating a lot of street food is take probiotics. Yeah. I don't know if they actually help or not, but it's just something that we think is a little extra precaution and we tend to take them. So yeah. do with that what you wish. <laughs> When it comes to the weather in China, we're not going to get too much into it in this video, but basically the main thing that you need to know is that China is a huge country and if you're visiting many different regions, 
the weather will vary depending you know between the different regions so yeah. once you know where you want to go and what time of year you're going or if you're planning that sort of thing then you'll just need to look up all the different regions and cities that you're going to and check what the weather is in those regions because yeah, the range as a whole over seasons and cities is just completely different you might have extremely hot summers or extremely cold winters so just bear that in mind and just generally speaking the seasons in sort of the northern part of china are quite different to the seasons in the southern part of China. There are also typhoon and monsoon seasons in more the southern part of China, so keep that in mind when you're planning a trip. But yeah, we're not gonna get into all of it here today, but just so you know that, yeah. for things to look at when you are planning a trip. So we're also just gonna have a quick talk about how we felt in terms of safety in China. So generally speaking, we felt safe the whole time. I can't think of an instance that we didn't feel safe. We felt safe as safe there as anywhere that yeah. we've been. It felt like a really safe country to be. We never yeah. really felt like we were yeah. in I, any risk at all. I feel like all the main all the main places, the public transport, um, basically anywhere that there was a lot of people, there was also quite a lot of police at times, but that in a good way, like in a way that you felt safer than being there. Yeah, so um, there was a lot of, um, in terms of safety, we did always feel quite safe. In the places that we have been, China is a huge country. Yeah. And we have not gone everywhere. So yeah. in the places we've been, we definitely felt safe. But yeah. then in terms of security, I think this kind of adds to it in that there is a lot of security in China. Like you were saying, um, security guards either or policemen on the streets, yeah. um, in the public transport hubs. Um, there's also a lot of, what do you call them? The, uh, we put your bags through. Like x-rays. Yeah, there's also a lot of like sort of, x-ray security and bag checks. checking things at all the train stations and metro stations and things like that yeah. so i think um also there's a lot of cctv cctv cameras on the streets and things like that so i think this all adds to that feeling of safety but it also adds to the feeling of like being watched so yeah. you do just make sure i think it's really important to follow the rules when you're in china because i do yeah. feel like there is always someone or something yeah. around you so when it comes to public bathrooms in China, the most common form of toilet is the squat toilet. So that is going to be the toilet of choice when you're out and about. But having said that, all the public bathrooms generally have a disabled toilet, which is usually a Western toilet if um, you are struggling to use the other type of toilet. And most uh, nice restaurants and shopping centers will also have Western style toilets in them as well, or a mixture. So it is possible to still use Western style toilets somewhere, yeah. um, but the most common form of public toilet you are gonna see is a squat toilet. Another thing to note is there is actually quite a lot of public toilets, especially in the major cities. So if you're out and about, it's a quite a useful thing to have around. <laughs> also, um, another thing is they generally don't have much toilet paper in the public bathroom, so make sure you always take like pocket tissues or something like that and some hand sanitizer just to be safe because there may or may not be soap or something like that available too. Another thing that's definitely worth mentioning in this video is if you're planning a trip to China, based on our experience, I'd probably say to try and avoid planning a trip to China during a public holiday or spring festival, golden week or any other event, unless it's an event that you're going there to experience. Yeah. Um, we've been in Hong Kong during Golden Week and in China for Chinese New Year and Spring Festival. And whilst there were some really interesting things that we witnessed during our time in Shanghai during Spring Festival, it also wasn't normal time either. So yeah. a lot of restaurants that we wanted to go to were shut for a long period of the two months that we were there. Um, a lot of things were different to what they'd normally be and all the train stations and things like that were also super busy and then super quiet as well. There was a, there was a weird time to be there. Yeah, super busy when people were leaving the cities to go and see their family in the more regional areas. Yeah. Um, and then quiet when no one was in the cities. Um, yeah. So it was a bit of both. So we actually chose to be there during Chinese New Year because we wanted to experience it. Yeah. Um, and because we knew we were going for two months that we'd see both sides. But if you're only planning a, a short trip or even a few weeks in China, 
I'd probably try and avoid it, like Chris said, because yeah. so many things are shut, yeah. um, so many restaurants, and not just for that time period. It could be a little bit before and yeah. weeks after. And every every restaurant's different too. It's not yeah. a it's not a straight rule. We had places that we wanted to go to on day one and could only go to in, in the all, second month of yeah. our of our two months there. So it's something that if, if you're going there with a lot of places that you do want to experience, it's probably not the best time to be yeah. there. And we're actually going to make a whole video on our experience of Chinese New Year. Um, so if you are interested in traveling in that time or just seeing what it's all about, um, we'll have that one coming out soon too. So we actually have a few more things listed on our blog, almostlanding.com, with things like electrical adapters and other little things that you might need to do before your trip to China. Yeah. So check that out. We'll link that in the description box below. But thanks so much for watching. Really hope that you found this video useful for planning a trip to China or just getting excited for the possibility of a trip yeah. to China. <laughs> but either way, thanks for watching and we really appreciate if you gave this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos. Yeah, and if you have been to China before and you have some tips and things that you think people should know before they go, yeah. please leave them in the comments and that'll be really helpful to everyone. And if you haven't been to China and you have any questions, then definitely let us know in the comments below. Thanks so much and see you next time.